Okay. Uh, welcome one and all. <clears throat> Because I am still sickly, I will make this uh, much sweeter than Kelly's classes. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. <clears throat> okay, we've been in uh, <clears throat> Genesis. Um, 16, and uh, we've been talking about, um, we kind of finished out 16 actually, but we wanted to <clears throat> talk a little bit more about this process, you know, that, um, that God initiated with Hagar. And it involved Sarah and her oppressiveness. And um, <clears throat> um, so I wanted to just um, delve into that a little more. <clears throat> and maybe look at, uh, maybe tonight, but maybe not. Maybe look into the, um, some of the future consequences that, that this has, has raised. And and what it says and what it speaks to <clears throat> in the heart of God, and this is the way I try to study the scriptures, I try to find not what the scripture says, because the Pharisees knew what the scripture says, and they, they judged and, you know, and did all this junk, including crucifying Christ. Um, but, but, <clears throat> but what is in the heart of that scripture and... Can I see the Lord in it or the Lord's heart? Because a lot of times we'll read statements. And to us, it's just a statement. It's just a statement. It's just a verse or a sentence. And um, um, we don't go, oh, this could be another clue to the way God thinks or the way that he is or the way that he sees those kind of things. <clears throat> and then I try to think, well, if I want the Lord, um, then I need to make my emphasis to know the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you do need to know the scriptures. There's no question about that. <clears throat> We're not saying you don't. We're saying that in the scriptures, that in the scriptures that we discover the Lord. Jesus said that, John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. But then he says, you will not come to me that you may have life. So we're trying to get life out of the scriptures, but not just any life. We're not just trying to get lively scriptures. We're trying to get the life of Christ. And at first, it is to... Be observant, observant enough to want to find him, to look for him, to search, to search the scriptures. That, that's John 5, 39, search the scriptures, to search the scriptures. And in that, um, <clears throat> not just reading, reading is fine, especially if you don't know the scriptures that well at this point. Some of you have been around long enough that you should know the meaning of every verse in the Bible. <laughs> Somebody's thinking, how old are these people? <laughs> I barely know anything. And, and hunger to know more of him. <clears throat> um, so we were talking about <clears throat> that when Hagar came back, remember, from Shur, that was on the border of Egypt, and when she returned to the camp, there was probably surprise with Abram and probably surprise with Sarah um, that she had returned. 
uh, and again, she had probably been gone for a fair amount of time to go all the way from, uh, I think they were in Hebron, but maybe not, all the way down to, to almost Egypt and then come back. That's basically a, the journey Israel took. Uh, we always get the feeling that they, they just did a circle. Don't you feel like Israel when they were in the wilderness, they're just sort of doing a big circle around it. Um, but she clearly would have made a straight shot and then back. Anyway, so from that we had surmised, and I think rightly so based on the scriptures that come after it, that Abram had, <clears throat> with her return, had assumed you know, when he heard that God was sending her back to them, that this is the promised seed because he just made a bunch of promises to them. So this has got to be it. See, we got to we got to be careful. <clears throat> we got to not, you know, assume that, um, you know, something that makes sense to our brain is necessarily it. Because something that makes sense to our brain may not make sense to him at all. I'm talking about your daily thoughts. But anyway, that's, a, that's another subject. We're not <laughs> so much truth to that, though. You know, <clears throat> y'all remember what we were talking about in, in the First Peter class last night? And, and Mar Mary uh, of Bethany is pouring out on Jesus, and Simon the leper, the Pharisee, says in his heart, that's what it says, he says in his heart, well, if that, you know, if that man really was a prophet, then he would have known what was going on here. And Jesus just turns and says, hey, you know, like we've been discussing this or something. <laughs> and that picture that I saw that is very, is very real to me. I don't think I'll ever forget that. Of, of God in our church services or any time, you know, overlooking us because we only really we kind of think that God only really is watching us in church you know it's like <laughs> you know really he only goes to church um, no no he, he's just with you all the time and you know we give out all this great advice and we we quote these scriptures and all this stuff and and that's fine but but I know for a fact that with a bunch of us, there's a, all kind of other stuff being thought and said that's going out, and he's getting it all. And it's so loud and so much that he can barely hear our precious little things that we say in church, you know. Oh, the Lord is, the Lord is good. Be hopeful. New creation fellowship, you know. He's going, shut up. You know, why would he tell me to shut up? Because all that other stuff you're saying, like don't be hopeful. If you were really a man of God, you would have known, you know, this sort of stuff. <clears throat> um, so there's another reason why Abram and Sarah might have believed that Hagar's child was the promised seed. Hagar had that special experience with God that demonstrated his care for her. So it's not just her coming back with information. She is literally, Hagar, the Egyptian, the Egyptian slave, uh, is coming back with a story that relates God's favor and God's care for her. And, um, you know, I, don't you think, I mean, this is just my thought, don't you think Sarah kind of went, well, he never talks to me. <laughs> You know, I mean, you, Hagar, you're a slave and, you know, you ran away. I mean, that's, she's not thinking I oppress. She's thinking you ran away. See? You say, well, it doesn't say that in the Bible. No, but it says it in your heart and my heart. We don't, we don't immediately go, we go, well, well, you're the problem, you know. <clears throat> and... And then we justify it with all these walls of protection around us so that we're safe and we feel good. <clears throat> That's fine. Do what you want to do. But if you want the Lord, if you want the Lord, then it's going to take you 
helping God take that wall down if you have to walk around it seven times. And you say, well, praise God, I can do that. What, what would that take? Seven times in a day? In a week, I could be free? Your walls span way bigger than Jericho's. <laughs> okay, it's going to take months, maybe years to get around once, okay? <clears throat> but if you're with the Lord, then things start happening, you know? Things do start happening. If you're not with the Lord, then it really, really, really takes a long time. And that's true, folks, that's true of all of us. Okay, you're listening. It's not pointed toward any one person. That's true of all of us. If you want the Lord, the Lord can expedite the thing. You know what I mean? It's like his, his, uh, <clears throat> his joy. <laughs> I mean, he leaves the 99, right? And goes and gets one lost sheep and brings it back. <clears throat> well, that's trying to show us his heart. But, you know... If, if that sheep ran off into the woods and married a wolf and said, let's have wolf sheep babies, he's not going to leave and go, no, you know, oh, I'm hunting for you, dear. He already knows the heart, you know. He's going to say, okay, little wolfie, you just stay out there with your, you know. Now you're going to be a, a, a sheep in wolf's clothes. <clears throat> okay. There is, uh, so um, Hagar had that special experience, and she did, with God, that demonstrated his care for her. Uh, she must have told Abram about it because he agrees with the child having the name Ishmael. I mean, he, he doesn't, you know what I mean? You, that's a big deal. You can see this all the way through the scripture, but it's a big deal that the father names the children. Okay? And so she comes back and says, God named him. <laughs> God named him. Abraham goes, he must have believed the story. He would have gone, ah, that wasn't God. The God of Egypt? Is that who you're talking about? No, your God. Your God showed up to me and told me all this cool stuff. You know, and the more he hears, he's going, that sounds like my God. So then he goes, uh, and, and she said, he's supposed to be called Ishmael. God hears. And he's going, God does hear. <laughs> God does hear. You know. I mean, if she said, you're supposed to call him Abraham Junior. You know, he, he goes, you ain't listening to God. <clears throat> All right. Um. In hearing the story from her and the miraculous events as she returned from running away from mistreatment, and I, I put in parentheses, she was not cast out as yet. So this part of the story is not where she's cast out. Okay, Because I don't know about you, but I, when I was doing this, this full search of, of Genesis, particularly with Abraham, um, it was easy for me to get these two stories stories mixed up because they actually have a lot of similarities of when she was cast out and then this one when she ran away. So I had to thread them out and go and really get it in my mind laid out and go, okay, now, now I'll remember this and not cross them over and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> Abram might have assumed indeed that this is the promised seed that God had in mind all along. And that's what I believe <clears throat> uh, happened. And that's what I believe the scriptures confirm after that, <clears throat> all the way up to really chapter 21. <clears throat> it's an issue and it's, a, and it's a bad issue. It's a worse issue with Abram over Ishmael than any of them. You know, remember all the ones that, that came forward, Lot and, and Eliezer and, and all, you know, all of the thoughts of uh, this being it. Ishmael was the firstborn, the firstborn, and he loved him as the firstborn, okay? But he wasn't the firstborn, and, and that one's on Abram. That's on Abraham. That's, that's his fault. 
because you have to know the you you know was I think I'm sorry I think that we call stuff the firstborn in us that is us just in different form we it's our, it's it's the best part of me you know so this has got to be the firstborn it's the best part of me you know but it's not me then it's him okay no no even by saying it's the best part of you it's probably one of the worst parts of you but your orientation's wrong <clears throat> and uh, you know god wants his son he's not playing around on that front you know and i don't say that as a warning or you know scary it's just that he he made up his mind before the foundation of the world and he made up his mind that if you were going to be with him, you were going to have to be in that sun. There would have to be oneness of nature and of kind and of image. That's what he wanted. Do you see that? And we go, well, salvation, <clears throat> salvation is the big deal. See, okay, so I'll tell you my opinion, and my opinion doesn't count for anything, but you take it to the Lord and see if it's, it's worth anything. <clears throat> my opinion is that whether Adam and Eve sinned in the garden or not, whether they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or listened to the devil or not, they still would have had to go through a process whereby they would have eaten of the tree of life. Because that tree of life represented what was in God's heart. <clears throat> and you notice it. You know, you, you know, you can see it throughout the scriptures that thrown in just every once in a while, even then in the book of Revelation. There is, so, so why would I say that? Well, I would say that <clears throat> because I believe that the epistles are the basic, the, the epistles are what we call the basic body of the New Testament, spends very little time dealing with, with trying to get us out of sin because Jesus took care of that at the cross, right? I mean, he did. I mean, again, if you sin, you know, we don't run up there to the throne room, take Jesus, throw him down, nail him to a cross, and let him die for that new sin that you died for. You, you did. You acknowledge that he died for all sin already, <clears throat> okay? Well, does that make him happy? We would go, yeah, that makes him really happy. Well, angels never sinned. Not the ones that are up there with him. They never sinned. And he's still looking for something out of us. More than angels. Hebrews gives you that. But what is that something? It's his son. But now we see Jesus. You know, even though he's already raised and higher than all this, he wants to see Jesus Christ and him crucified. He wants to see the lamb. He wants to see that nature of self-giving. I, I was reading in uh, John 13 today. Believe it or not, I read the Bible a lot. And so I, just, just, and I don't always remember where it was at, so I, I do good when I do. But I was reading in John 13, and, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jesus is saying to his disciples, um, I must go away. I must go away. And that, right after that, the next verses, he goes off on this thing, but <clears throat> so I give you a new commandment. And it, it is, you know, that you love one another as I have loved you. And he's fixing to show it that night, if I'm not mistaken, or pretty quick there on the cross, the real love. And he describes it. Greater love hath no man than a man give his life for his friends. And he's, he's saying all this about the cross for them, for them, so that they'll get it, they'll get it. And Peter's still going, okay, so why can't I go with you where you're going? Well, I think Jesus is talking about the cross. So Jesus does say, okay, you know, where I go, you can't go, but, you know, you will follow afterwards. We go, he's... Oh, he's going to go to heaven. <laughs> no, he dies on a cross too, just upside down. And beyond physical, Jesus isn't talking about physical when he's talking about this kind of love. 
And um, so, <clears throat> uh, oh gosh, there's so much crossover there with the, even the first Peter class. You can't hardly talk about Peter without <clears throat> jumping in the middle of that stuff. So, um, you know, we, we give, we, some churches, some denominations make so much out of sin all the time instead of Christ being formed in us. And, I mean, you read Ephesians, and I'm sorry I'm going off on this, but I, it's the truth. You read Ephesians, and he says, you know, that we were predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, but it talks about it being uh, placed in him. And there the adoption takes place, and there is the, all the reality, and it just keeps saying in him. We are in him. We are before the foundation of the world. You were chosen in him. And we go, well, praise God. Well, if it's predestined, then I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> and, and that's not what he's saying either. He said, what he's saying is, if you're going to be with me, and you're going to have to be in him, and if you're in him, and you abide in him, because see, see, he could have said, just get in me by my work on the cross 2,000 years ago, and never worry about it again. You're one. You're one, and you won. <laughs> You're one, and you won. <laughs> and it's wonderful. <clears throat> but then, and this is still on the day that he died, if I'm not mistaken, or that day before he died. <coughs> Excuse me. That he says, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. Abide in me, and I abide in you. And he says, if you don't bring forth fruit, well, what is fruit? Tell me. Somebody tell me. I just would like to hear it. What would fruit be, Jim? Okay, fruit would be him, but it really would be him in a certain form called fruit. What would that be? What? Nature form, which would be practically, in a practical way, what? It would be willing to... Rush over and uh, uh, lift somebody higher than yourself and to use whatever you have to bless them instead of, you know, using them to, to bless you. You know, maybe against their will, maybe not knowing that they're doing that. All of that is not his fruit. So he says, break it off, burn it. Wait a minute. Once saved, always saved. You know, or wait a minute. Um, uh, you know, you said if we're one, and he would go, we're not one. Because oneness to him involves a life and an image and a nature. It does. There's no getting around it. It does. Okay. <clears throat> so, for those of you that are freaking out now, uh, you know, going, well, I did something wrong, so am I not one, you know? If you did something wrong, ask him to forgive you, and then you're forgiven, okay? But he can't forgive nature if you're just going to go with that nature forever. Now, I've been at this a lot longer than you, so if one of you guys did something and I did the same thing, it wouldn't be as bad, the Lord wouldn't look at you as bad as he would me, because I'm responsible to, I am, I am, what's, what's James say? Don't become a teacher because, you know, you'll get the greater condemnation. You still have time to grow and whatever, you know. I mean, I'll be gone in two years, so anyway. You still have time to grow. And, that's, you know, the Lord is going to bring you on. He's going to draw you. And, you know, steady growth, but not overwhelming growth. You know, you'd like that. I would like that for you. But it doesn't happen that way. It just, it just takes a while. He's so, he's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. He is the fullness that filleth all in all. You know, you know so it's kind of a joke 
three and a half years, and yet Jesus chose that, and it, we have confirmations in the scripture, right? About three years. So we got a three year Bible school. <clears throat> But how many of you that have gone through Bible school here, when you graduated, you instantly became a, a super Christian? Raise your hand. Go ahead, raise your hand. <laughs> oh yeah, you didn't graduate. Well, we don't want to be super Christians. We want Jesus right now, right now, not not tomorrow or last week. We want Jesus right now. And we want Jesus as much as we can get him right now. And if that be a little bit, but we're seeking, then a little bit counts. A little bit counts. And <clears throat> when you get older and you've been in the Lord for a while, <clears throat> a little bit can add to a whole bunch more. I mean, it can explode. Seriously, it can, because you've got so much of the word and the things that the Lord has shown you in different places, and he just brings it all together. And, you know, I mean, it really, many times with the Holy Spirit, it's just like he, he walks up to a big canvas, you know, and, and he just starts painting. And then he brings in this over here, and he <clears throat> pushes that up to that side where you thought it was supposed to be over here. And he just colors it and, and fills it and, and <clears throat> you just go holy moly this is incredible <clears throat> but that didn't happen too much when I was young it was I remember that I, when we were in Bible school those who were with me <clears throat> that lady right there uh, we if we got one little, little nugget that's what we called it you know, just a little nugget. Just, oh, it's gold, though. It's real gold. Look. Look, it's gold. I'll treasure this forever. And you probably will because you got it from the Lord. You know what I mean? I, you know, y'all know that I, I constantly go back to even Bible school and remember so much of those little nuggets that just were incredible, but they weren't attached so much yet. They needed, they needed, they needed the, the bigger canvas, and my canvas was just a little bitty, you know, matchbox cover or something, you know. You know, look, I got three nuggets, you know. <clears throat> so, um, so we can look in that in relationship to Hagar. We can, we can take all kind of examples and go, okay, well, am I Hagar? Well, <clears throat> Yes, you are, but the promised seed is in you. Do you understand that? You're, you know, you would say, well, I'm Sarah, but you're also Hagar. You're, the, you're, you're anything that's not him. Do you understand that? That's the bad, the good, the whatever. You're anything that's not him. You know, you go, well, where, where am I in the Bible? Well, everywhere it doesn't say Jesus. You know, and <coughs> excuse me. So, so to me, um, you know, Paul said, "Look, I've not yet attained." I love that. I look, I look at him, and I go, "You haven't attained? Then what am I? Chop liver?" <laughs> you know. Um, but I like what he said after that. But I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ. That's, you know, uh, he also says being found in him, not having mine own righteousness. You know, that's tough. We'll give a, you know, we, we have a hard time giving up our own sin. You know, he says not having my own righteousness. You know, well, I'm. I'm very righteous. I don't need to give it up. You know, I'm so with the Lord. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and that's the scary thing, see, because the Lord's going to have to show you that you're not so with the Lord. You're, <clears throat> you're the, the worst things in the Word of God, and then when you see that, you can either freak out and say, you know, well, that's me, I admit it, and then, you know, 
quit or worse, or you press towards the mark of the prize. Not, not that I have attained, but I am pressing. And pressing doesn't mean playing with it, you know, playing with the scriptures. And, I hugged my Bible today, you know. <clears throat> you need to have that bad Bible slap you in the face today. <clears throat> you know, just a good old slap in the face from a Bible not held by man, meaning I'm not <laughs> encouraging you to be slapping one another with a Bible. <laughs> just open it and let the Lord reach up and go, hey, that's not it. <clears throat> really? <laughs> yeah, really. Should I get with you? Yeah. Should, should I be pursuing you? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. That's my lecture for today. Now, after I take a drink, we shall return to the Bible school class. All right, so um, <clears throat> Hagar returns and submits to harsh treatment. As we continue in the story of, in Genesis 16, we note that for now, Hagar returns to Sarah's abuse and will continue to be lowly as a slave girl and surrogate. <clears throat> she serves, and this is important, she serves under duress as she herself I will reread this statement because you'll need it. She serves under duress as she herself foreshadows the fate of Israel's future by the Egyptians. <clears throat> Ready for me to read it again? I can't. I accidentally erased it. <clears throat> Not really. She serves under duress as she herself foreshadows the fate of Israel's future by the Egyptians. <clears throat> okay. Sure. It's taken all my strength just to stand up here right now. She serves under duress like me as she herself foreshadows the fate of Israel's future by the Egyptians. Okay, so we're going to see that some things are going to transpire in the future and that they're their source will be pointed back to. <clears throat> okay, while Abram and Sarah may have assumed God's words to Hagar concerning uh, Israel, uh, Ishmael <clears throat> meant that he becomes the heir of promise and that that's why he told that to her because she's saying all this stuff <clears throat> and I can see Abram particularly, but maybe even Sarah going, okay, so this is the heir. This is the one. We've been waiting for this for 10 years. This is it. And they're listening and, and they're getting a witness from the Lord that what she's saying is true about this, but not about being the heir. See? God never said that Ishmael was going to be the heir. But it's easy to read that into it. <clears throat> um, and, that, and that was why he told her to return. The Lord knows differently. In other words, they're assuming this is why the Lord told her to return. Because she's got the heir within her. This was, you know, Can you see maybe Sarah going... <gasps> right I was right I knew it in my little heart 
Yeah, that's right. Why do I feel like I'm going to hell? But anyway, I was right. <clears throat> not, not really. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the Lord knows differently. The Lord knew her... <coughs> <clears throat> the Lord knew her return had nothing to do with Hagar's seed becoming the heir. The Lord knew that. But all the circumstances line up to say that he is. <clears throat> well, the circumstances aren't God. And while I can, I believe that sometimes the Lord lines up things as a confirmation <clears throat> I think it should be a confirmation and not your only source. That's just me. I don't know. But I've made many mistakes and I've tried to learn from them. And I just think it's, you know, I just think it's wise to, to let circumstances confirm something instead of being the only confirmation that you have. All right. Um, <clears throat> it is in the face of the harsh treatment of Sarah, he tells her to go back and to submit to it. <clears throat> Does this seem unfair? And all the people said, and the people on this side said, yeah, it does. It does. It's not unfair. It is working the plan of God. <laughs> Does the cross seem unfair if you don't want to die? Yeah. Yeah. Does this seem unfair if, if, <clears throat> if you want your son to be born, you want him to... Uh, Thrive, you want him to have kings come out of him, you want, which is what God promised Ishmael, remember? And you're thinking you're in the wilderness and you're dying out there and it's almost over. You're kind of glad to hear it. And when he says, go back and go under this treatment, I can do that for my child. Has any, any woman ever done that for their child? Something really, really hard before. Well, just having the child, first of all, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the big picture concerning, concerning Sarah's attitudes. We're now basically finished with chapter 16 of Genesis, except that I would like to show the greater effects of Sarah's harshness towards Hagar and her child. We return to that event, event but now link it to the future. Hagar. An Egyptian is oppressed <coughs> by Abram's wife. But in the future, for the length of 400 years, Abraham's seed will be oppressed by Egyptians. <coughs> In both cases of abuse, the Lord had them, Hagar and Israel, remain under the oppression for a long period of time. Amen? He had them both remain under oppression for a long period of time. <clears throat> we can go back to, that's unfair, by the way, in my, in my iPad here, it's in red. Unfair. Because that's how we always react. <clears throat> with red, this is unfair. <clears throat> or it's God, and it's God in his mercy, and it's God who is working to bring forth his son, and it's God who is in his incredible mercy, working to bring forth his son in, you know, a garbage bin, a trash can, a dumpster. <clears throat> me, me, not you. Well, I know where I came from. So I don't, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, to the hungry, every morsel is sweet, you know, right? It's like, 
This is a blessing. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I remember times of thinking in a situation where it was others could complain. I remember thinking, this is a blessing to be in this with the Lord. You know, wow. I mean, I just thought this, I mean, because <laughs> I thought so many times I was in trouble when it wasn't the Lord and then having pushed back because of that. And I'm going, man, this is great. I'm just, I'm able to be in this with the Lord because, <clears throat> you know, all the other times it was just my own mess ups. In verse 11, it says that the Lord hath heard thy affliction <clears throat> or paid attention to Hagar's plight, which is similar words to what God said to Abram's seed, bringing them out of Egypt, Egyptian bondage in Exodus. <clears throat> so a couple of scriptures here. One's in Deuteronom Deuteronomy 26, <clears throat> verse 6 and 7, if you want to just jot that down or look it up. Deuteronomy 26, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> well, if you're going to look it up, I'm going to drink. Maybe it'll help my throat. Sure. Thank you. Deuteronomy 26, 6 and 7. <clears throat> and the Egyptians evil treated us. <laughs> this is Israel. And the Egyptians evil treated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried unto the Lord, God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. Now, what does that sound like? Be honest with you. That's where Ishmael came from. So should we be super excited? <laughs> Thanks for getting where I was going there. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Should we be super excited since God said that to Ishmael, that Israel might be just as bad off on certain fronts, so much so that maybe you get him in the wilderness instead of conforming to the image of his son, all they do is murmur and complain and, you know. <clears throat> Can I get an old me? <clears throat> um, and then in um, Exodus chapter 2, uh, verse 23, and I'm going to start at the latter part of 23 through 25. The children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abram with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. <clears throat> okay, so really, if you look at this, okay, the children of Israel side by reason of the bondage, okay, they, <clears throat> it doesn't say that they cried out to God in the sense of, oh Lord, we want you, we're seeking you, we're after you. Does that make sense? They're just, they're just sighing because the bondage that they're in is so hard, all right? <clears throat> uh, their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Because we believe that if you have <clears throat> a legitimate cry of oppression and someone is exalting themselves while oppressing you and you cry unto the Lord, that he hears your cry due to the oppression, due to the bondage, okay? <clears throat> because that's the kind of God that we have, all right? And, but, it, but there's more. And uh, God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abram and with Isaac and with Jacob. So by this time, he's made this covenant with all three of them. And God looked upon them and had respect unto them because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and because of what he had promised them which was what? The seed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians 
He saith that the promises that he made were not unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, which seed is Christ. So that it is, it is as if the father is wanting to see his son and, um, and he's wanting at some juncture, because you could say, well, he didn't really get it in, in Exodus, in bondage, because they didn't do what Hagar did. They didn't come back and serve in the right spirit. Does that make sense? So he takes them out into the wilderness before he brings them into the land to test them. Doesn't it say that? In Deuteronomy, what, eight? Some, uh, yeah, yeah. You should read it. <laughs> it's, it's an eye-opener why God took them out in the wilderness. You, you begin to realize that <clears throat> that wasn't the test run <laughs> in the sense of, you know, where you can take your wings in the sense that was where he was going to find out what you really <laughs> had in you, and he did find out what he had in them. <clears throat> and that generation died in the wilderness. They never came in. They never got past the wilderness. They never got past complaining. <clears throat> they never got past um, being able to handle oppression in a right spirit, which relates to the cross. Can I get amen on that one? Okay. So, and does this sound like anything I've ever taught before? Okay, good. Recently? <laughs> Maybe it's in the Bible in a lot of places, but there's, there are things yet to discover. <clears throat> um, so, in these things we need to know the Lord in the inward parts, and that's a fact. We need to know the Lord in the inward parts, and that's part of what the sacrifice was all meant to be about. God will eventually send his son, he will be a lamb. You will do to him what you did to the lamb to, on, on Rosh Hashanah and all the other times. And um, you will take the lamb, you'll slaughter the lamb, you'll open him up, you'll take the inward parts and you'll show them unto God. I see him, you see him. <clears throat> this is a similar thing, I think, not that you can <clears throat> see it there in the prodigal son story, but I think when the father took him over to the fatted calf, I mean, the fatted calf, folks, is, is a bullock. It is, and a bullock is a, you know, a young calf. And, and he showed his son, his prodigal, the son that was in him that was in the prodigal, but he didn't know it. He revealed it at the cross or at the altar. He revealed him. He revealed his inward parts. And the son was in such a state of mind that, you know, it was like, look, I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a mess. <clears throat> I'm glad I've, I've got that word to fall back on because mess doesn't really say it. <clears throat> but you can't use certain words. Well, some people do. I don't know who they are, but I understand there are some teachers that use off-color words. <clears throat> but, um, the son was so messed up and so full of himself in a good way in the beginning and then in full of himself in a bad way at the end, which means there was no change. It was just the circumstances changed. Everything was going good. He had all this stuff from the father. He, he spent it all. He could do all this fun stuff. But over here now, he's, he's still full of himself, but it's you know, I've failed you, I've done this, I'm bad, I'm, you know, it's like, like the father's really going, yeah, I love to hear this. You know, I love to hear how bad my children are. 
you know. No, he doesn't. He doesn't love that. What he wants to hear is <clears throat> you to shut up long enough, excuse my French for that, long enough for you to hear and watch him demonstrate and reveal the lamb that is the family spirit. And see, the, here, see this? See the inward parts? Now we're going to show it to God, and he's going to be happy because he knows that this self-giving lamb, this is what's on the inside of him, and this has to be what's on the inside of us. And this is on the inside of me. That's why I was a lamb and let you go off and destroy yourself and almost die out there. But, you know, I'm risking these things too. Because you have free will, amen? That's right. So, I, you know, he's risking also. <clears throat> but I think the father, I think he, <clears throat> he picked up something when they started shoving the ring on and all this kind of stuff. And the prodigal's going, I don't deserve anything. Why is this a, wait a minute, you know? <clears throat> and he said, okay, we're going to go past that. We're going to talk about slaughtered lamb. So, <coughs> I'm going to stop here, but uh, the, my last statement here was, in these things we need to know the Lord in the inward parts. Do you agree with that? By the time you see me Sunday, I may even be well. Or not. <laughs> Praise God. Do you love the Lord? Do you want the Lord? So do I. I want the Lord. I want the real Lord. You know? <clears throat> I don't want to be following rabbit trails that don't, don't lead to him, you know. You say, well, you feel that way because, you know, you're older and you don't have that much time or whatever. No, 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 I've always felt that way. I just, I've always felt like life is too short to be following rabbit trails and playing at this and that and whatever. And <clears throat> I, know, I know some of you feel the exact same way. It's just I just want him. This is my time to get him. I want to go. I want to. I don't want to play. I just want you, Jesus. I want you. And it's not about saying publicly, "I want the Lord," is it? It's about saying to Him, "I want you, Lord," and knowing what you're talking about. But you can't even say that if you hadn't seen the inward parts of Him. What he's like, the way his heart is, the way he would respond, the way he thinks, the way you have to start having those things identified. And then you go, okay, you know, Lord, thank you for opening our eyes and our hearts to <clears throat> see what you're really like. And then thank you for giving us the grace to look at that and say it's beautiful. That's not that's beautiful and I'm ugly. So Lord, we cry out, but not by reason of our bondage. We cry out because we want you and we want we want to be different, but we want you to be the difference. We want to be changed, but we don't want it to be a Another version of us, for God's sake, no, and no, no, no. Let it be your son. Let it be Christ. Let it be the lamb that rules not on a throne in heaven, a slaughtered lamb that rules in our heart and our motives in the way we think. Let it be the lamb that we give place to rule and reign. Father, thank you for your spirit that is here 
that wants to draw us more and more. May we respond, in, in the, even if it's just the littlest of ways, may we respond to you and acknowledge you that you're, you're here and you're reaching out. We ask it, Father, in his name. Amen. All right. We got a few minutes before the next class, so.